love, learn, live, grace you. And we have been talking for the past several weeks about spiritual meditation. How many of you have been meditating? Now I'm going to start asking you that every week because if I'm teaching you to engage in spiritual meditation and if you don't do that, then the message will not help you. It's, it's as if you go to the doctor and he gives you some medication and you go home and don't take it. Then the medication cannot help you. It is as if you are giving a person instructions on how to get from point A to point B. And they do not follow those instructions. They will forever remain lost. So remember preaching is designed for behavior changes and influence. So every word that's presented, every message then... It will only help you if you begin to follow the instructions thereof. Amen. Unfortunately, it is possible to be in the place where the instructions are provided and not utilize them and get no value out of it. It is children who go to school, but they do not study. They don't learn. They don't practice the math. They don't do that. So it's possible to sit in a classroom with a great teacher, but come out with no benefit right. so spiritual meditation I want to challenge you to start spiritually meditating for the rest of your life as a matter of fact the very first thing you do in the morning when you get up is you engage for a couple of minutes in spiritual meditation now King David concerned himself with the spiritual quality of his meditation when he talked about let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. He was concerned about whether or not his spiritual meditation met God's approval. Now, when you take a class, whatever it is, at some point you want to know, does my study meet my instructor's approval? That's why the instructor will give you an examination. It is only then that the instructor comes to realize that my, your study meets my approval. So frequently, the psalmist meditated on the Word of God. When you read Psalms 19 verses 1 through 7, he is meditating on the Word of God. Amen. But in verses 8 through 14, he is meditating on on the work of God. So not only do we meditate deliberately, consciously concentrate on the word of God, but we deliberately, consciously concentrate on the work of God. Amen. We can learn much not only from what people say, but we can learn from what they do. We learn some things from what God said. But then what he has done also gives us some great insight. And when we learn to meditate, here is what God does. He uses our personal experience of spiritual meditation to inspire us beyond human imagination. Now let me say that again because I really want you to understand the connection thereof. God uses our spiritual meditation to inspire us beyond our personal imagination. Now what I've just said to you is that God will do something with you. He will do something through you. He will propel you to a greater height. He will inspire you to a level uh, that's greater and higher if you will meditate. In other words, there are some things that God will do with you, for you, and through you if he can get you to engage in spiritual meditation. But he can never get you to do that if you don't engage in spiritual 
meditation. Kind of reminds me of the, the lady that had fallen into the water and was drowning. And the lifeguard reached in there and grabbed her by the leg and he didn't realize she had an artificial leg so the leg came off. He reached back and grabbed her by the hair and her hair piece came off. And he said to her, he said, I can save you, but you're going to have to keep yourself together. <laughs> now, if she doesn't keep herself together, then the life God cannot save us. As skilled as he is, as powerful, as wise as God is, we limit him by the things that we hesitate or fail or refuse to do. In other words, there are things in your life God will never be able to do unless you start engaging in spiritual meditation. And when you engage in spiritual meditation, he will inspire you. He will enable you. He will lead you to accomplish things you never dreamed of. You will be better. You can do greater than you have ever thought you could. As a matter of fact, you will baffle yourself. You said, wow, I never thought I could do that. So instead of us saying, I can't do that, what we need to do is to meditate enough so God will inspire us to do it. Amen. Now, today we want to finish the series here on uh, spiritual meditation. We'll do another series starting next week. Uh, but how do we meditate? How do we do that? What, is the, what are the practical steps to meditating. That's what I want to share with you today. How do we actually do that? So I want to walk you through some practical stages of spiritual meditation. All right. We meditate by deliberately narrowing our consciousness to include one element at a time. I'm going to show you how we do that. You have to narrow. You have to deliberately, consciously narrow uh, to include just one element at a time. Now I want you to look at your hand. Everybody look at your hand. Everybody look at your hand. Now I want you to just kind of look at your whole hand. You see your hand? Now don't look at me. Look at your hand. Your hand, okay? Now I want you to look at your hand. Now I want you to just look at all of your fingers. I want you to look at all of your fingers. And then I want you to... To, to move your focus into the center of your hand. How I many of you have an M in your hand? Uh, okay, you got. Now, I want you to now narrow that focus to just one specific line. Ignore the M and just look at one specific line in your hand. See, now that's what I mean. You narrow that focus, you stop glancing at everything, and you focus down. To one specific thing. For example, I, I could stand here and look at this audience. And then I could look at one role. Then I could look at one person. Then I could look at one face. And then I could look at one eye. And then I could narrow that down and see that one curly eyebrow that's out of place. See, that's narrowing the focus. So we deliberately concentrate and we narrow that focus of the word of God and the work of God. Let me show you again how that's done. We concentrate exclusively upon the word of God by narrowing our focus. Now we may narrow our focus. We may be thinking in terms of a book of the Bible. Say book of the Bible. Say book of the Bible. And then we narrow it down from a book of the Bible to a chapter in the Bible. Say chapter in the Bible. And then we narrow it down to a verse in the Bible. Say verse in the Bible. And then we narrow it down to a word in that verse. See, that is deliberately, consciously concentrating by narrowing our focus. Now, I'm going to give you a verse, and we're going to do that. Okay, look up in Matthew chapter 19. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 11. 
Matthew chapter 11, you've heard this verse over and over again. Come to me, all ye who weary and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now that's Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Now let's narrow our focus. We can look at that, and we're trying to figure out what does that mean, and, and all of that, and then we can narrow our focus down to the word yoke. Right. We look at that. What, what does that word yoke mean? A yoke connects an animal to its burden. Mm -hmm. You have a horse and you want to pull a plow. You have oxen. You want to pull a plow. You do what? Connect the oxen to the plow using what? A yoke. All right. Now, when you look then and understand that, when we look at this verse, Jesus said, take my yoke. And then with that yoke, there's often there's some padding in that yoke. So the yoke is designed to connect the animal comfortably to the burden so that the animal is able to do more with the burden than they would be without the yoke envision a moment with a horse and I want you to just think of a wooden yoke well you can think of yourself if you just put some some wood around your neck how painful that's going to be but if we put some pad under it so then a yoke enable the people of God to carry a greater burden now, most of the time in our prayer, what are we praying for? God, get me out from under this burden. That's not what Jesus is teaching. He's teaching us how to prepare so we can carry a greater burden. How many of you ever carried uh, a gallon of water? You know, those water, a gallon of water with a water pail with, a, with that metal handle on it. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, sometimes uh, being as old as I am, uh, my illustrations kind of fly over the head of the young people and they may not have no idea but you you know there's that wire everybody see that anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about okay and, and on that wire there's a what there's a handle and that handle is larger you know if you are carrying a gallon of water with that handle you can carry it longer than you can if there is no handle it's like a yoke. It makes it possible for you to carry a greater burden. Amen. Without the handle, you probably carry a gallon. And by the time you get to the road, your hand is hurting. But if you have a handle, you can probably carry five gallons. So when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Amen. Now, if we don't meditate on that verse, you'd never know that. Right. We have to narrow our focus. What does that mean? Take my yoke and learn. In other words, what Jesus is saying, instead of being disconnected from your burden, learn how to be efficient and effective carrying your burden. Amen. Now that's almost the opposite of most of our prayers. Because every painful experience we have, we, oh Lord, remove us from this. That's not what Jesus emphasized. So we need to learn, and it is through spiritual meditation that we learn how to connect to life's burdens and bear them and bear them effectively and efficiently. You know, what do you think your employer think if every time they give you a difficult assignment, all you do is complain? They're going to let you go and get an employee that will do what they're asking them to do. Yeah. With, and the people who get promoted are those who connect to the challenging responsibilities and carry them out effectively. Mm -hmm. And so what Jesus is teaching us, rather than being immediately ready to say, Lord, please get me out of this situation. He simply says, help me to learn how to stay right here and do a good job. Yeah. You see, and, and we learn that by spiritual meditation. Amen. All right. So we spiritually, we narrow that focus in the word of God. 
Now, then we concentrate exclusively upon the work of God by narrowing our focus. Now, here is a verse of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now we can look at that and we say, oh my awesome, God, uh, the Son of God has awesome name. Look at his name, wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. Look at all of the dimensions of our heavenly father. But now then we can narrow that focus. Now watch this carefully. We narrow our focus deliberately to just one of his works. Right. Look at the word counselor. Yeah. He is our what? Counselor. Say counselor. counselor. Say he is my counselor. Is my counselor. Say it louder. He is my counselor. Say it again. He is my counselor. Now watch that. Now see, when you meditate, now you realize Jesus is your counselor. So guess what? I don't have to ask other folk for their opinion. Because Jesus is my counselor. You know, I do a lot of counseling. I, I generally don't counsel people if they have another counselor. Because my counsel might conflict with the counsel they're getting from somewhere else. Okay, now watch that text. Now watch that and when you meditate, you can make this meaningful. Jesus is our counselor. So whenever you have an anxious moment, then we seek the counsel of Jesus. That save you a lot of money. Save you a lot of money. You know, counselors are expensive. They don't come cheaply. But guess what? If you let Jesus be your counselor. But you know something? If you go to the counselor's office and go to sleep while he's giving you counsel, his counsel will not help. If the counselor gives you advice and you leave his office and forget it, it will not help you. So what we have to condition ourselves to do is to gain great insight to the counsel of Jesus. Amen. So our first question ought to be, when we face a situation, what is Jesus saying? Amen. What is he saying to me? Amen. What's Jesus' counsel when someone cut us off in traffic? What's Jesus' counsel? What's Jesus' counsel when a person's supposed to pick us up and they are late? What's Jesus' counsel when someone wait to the last minute and ask us to do something and now we got to rush? What's Jesus' counsel? What's Jesus' counsel when somebody call you out of your name? What's his counsel? You can't just put your hand on your hip and say, you know, this is the way I've always been. My mama had a temper. My daddy never let anybody talk to him. What's Jesus' counsel? Is he our counselor? And when we deliberately, consciously concentrate, we then see him as our counselor. Amen. So whatever the situation is, he has great counsel. Amen. And we get to that point by narrowing our focus on the work of the Lord. And then there's a time when we deliberately, consciously concentrate by widening our consciousness. Instead of us looking at the word yoke, we ask ourselves, what is the book of Matthew about? What's the theme of the book? And so we widen that focus and we widen as we look at the word, we widen it as we look at the work of God. All right. So narrowing and widening. Now, when you narrow, uh, when you uh, narrow your concentration Here's some things you do as we conclude. Here's some what happens. You increase your awareness. You increase your awareness. See, just a moment ago when you looked at your hand, how many of you had sat down sometime recently and just looked right there at one line in your hand? I hadn't done that in a long time. All right. And I noticed that what used to be a defined M, it might look like a W, depending on which way you look at it now. Okay? 
Okay? So you increase your awareness. Do you realize how many things around you pass you by and you never see them? You never notice them because you do not deliberately, consciously concentrate. I was communicating with a preacher friend of mine over in Texas a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and, and I sent him, he, we were, he was doing some talking, he was doing some teaching on Facebook, and so I sent him a verse to look at, and he wrote me back and said, I have never seen that verse before. He said, I've never seen that before. And he was amazed by what it taught. Now, no doubt he's read the Bible. And no doubt some of you have read the Bible through. But I guarantee you there are verses and words that we did not concentrate on. And so guess what? Until we do that, you miss the value therein. You just miss it. You just miss it. All right? So it increases our awareness. It intensifies our awareness. It intensifies our awareness. And when you increase and intensify your awareness, you renew your mind. We're going to be talking about this in detail in some weeks to come. Because, see, this is where the rubber meets the road. You got to renew your mind. How many of you have children? Everybody have children? You remember teaching your children to do something? And then you, they, they didn't do it the way you taught them. And then you reminded them of how you taught them. And then sometime later, they were still not doing it the way you taught them. You know what happened? They didn't renew their mind. They didn't renew their mind. All right, now let's apply that to us. You've sat and heard word preached. You've been in Bible study. You've read the Bible, but you didn't change. You didn't embrace what you discovered. You know what happened? You didn't renew your mind. So we have to renew our mind. It is not just enough to be baptized. We have to renew our mind. And so the life of Jesus is designed to teach us how to renew our minds. Amen. And when we renew our minds, we become different people. That's right. See, that's how we become new. By renewing your mind. Because if you think differently, you will then behave differently. And so the Bible is designed to get us to adopt the thoughts of God. But we can't find out what God's thoughts are until we start meditating on his word. Amen. Meditating on his word. So when you increase and intensify your awareness, you renew your mind. Now, when you renew your mind, you accelerate your spiritual transformation. You accelerate your spiritual transformation. You, you, you ever been around some people, some people who get it quickly, and some folk, it take them a long time to get it? Mm -hmm. Or you've known some folk who may have become Christians, and it took, and you know, they immediately just started out doing totally different. And some other folk, they were Christians for 15 years, and they still hadn't changed but two or three things in their life. Mm -hmm. See, it's because they did not renew their mind, and when you renew your mind, you can accelerate your spiritual transformation. Uh, see, but whenever, always remember this, whenever you receive instructions, if you receive them grudgingly, mm -hmm. the longest it's going to take you to benefit from it. You ever train someone and you're training them and they didn't want to learn what you was trying to teach them? It took you forever to try to train them, didn't it? And they still didn't have get it. But that excited learner who wants to do, who wants to grasp it. So when we renew our mind, we accelerate our spiritual transformation. And see, that's God's natural process. But what we want to do sometimes is we just want to pray about it. As if prayer is the solution to everything. Prayer will not override a mind that will not meditate on the word of God. Amen. Listen, it's like a, a person who doesn't want to study and then just pray they pass the test. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you say to your children? They say, oh, I don't study. I just pray. <laughs> you say, where do you get that idea from? They say, I got it from you. <laughs> so you don't change anything. All you do is just pray. So we got to learn how, and see, that's why people who understand God's design can benefit even greater than Christians because they are employing God's natural process. Amen. Listen, if, if I have a combination lock, 
and I tell you what the combination is. You can be an atheist, and guess what? You can open that lock. But if I don't tell you what the lock, the combination is, you can pray all day long. And it's going to take you a long time to look up on that. Okay? So, a non-believer who learns God's system can have greater benefit than a believer who keeps rejecting it. So what we have to learn is God has so designed it for us to have to participate and cooperate with him and spiritual meditation is where it starts. And when you renew your mind, you accelerate your spiritual transformation. And then through personal experience of spiritual meditation, we educate our mind. Amen. See, you cannot do what you have not learned. That's right. And God has a natural learning system. Yes, yes. We'll be talking about that and some time in the future. And then when we do that, when we educate our conscious mind, we permanently improve the quality of our decisions. Amen. We permanently improve the quality of of our decisions. Can I tell you something? You're where you are today because of the decisions that you have made. Amen. Now children, young children always say, I, I got in trouble. No, you didn't get in trouble. You talked. You made a decision to talk when the teacher told you to shut up. <laughs> you know, I, I, I notice people uh, in prison, I, I've done some jail ministry and talked to people. And, and I noticed one other thing. Rarely did I ever meet a person who acknowledged what they did. I said, man, what are you in jail for? He said, I caught a case. I said, man, you didn't catch a case. You broke in Kroger. <laughs> I caught a case. And then here's the terminology here all the time. They charged me with. And I don't know what they charged you with. What did you do? You see? So then... You are in jail because of the decisions that you made. That's right. Now I found out recently there's an interesting law here in South Carolina. And that, at least I was told that and I'm going to accept that to be true until I find out it's not. And that is that if you are with someone, if you're riding in their automobile mm -hmm. and there's something illegal in the car, mm -hmm. everybody is charged. That's right. That's right. That's right. Everybody. Now, so you need when you decide to ride with somebody and they got some stuff in the car. Mm -hmm. See, you, you, you solve that back at the decision level. Mm -hmm. Don't ride with folk you don't know. Right. Listen, before you get in the car with some people, so listen, man, before I ride with you, we got to go by the police station, get the police dog and, and search out <laughs> your car. See if you got anything in here. I want to ride with you. Well, you know, we were going to the same place and I just wanted to save some gas. Well, uh, that saving gas might be pretty expensive on the end. So if you want to change your quality of life, you've got to change the decisions that you make. You can't make bad decisions and then pray that God rescue you from continual bad decisions. But the quality of decisions that you make are going to be made based upon how well your mind has been educated. See, that's why parents have to teach children, give them abundance of information so they will be able to make right decisions. If they don't have the information, they're not able to make right decisions. And so all of that takes place when we learn how to meditate on the Word of God. Amen. And God wants us to upgrade our lives. See, now, we don't learn to do this. If we don't start meditating on the Word, you can come to church from now on and nothing in your life changes. And then your friends will look at you and say, I don't know why you go to church or you ain't no better than you were before you start going. And that is because you have not upgraded your life. Listen, it is like taking a person who has no table manners and sending them to an etiquette class and they still eat with their elbows on the table. See, they didn't upgrade their life. They just didn't. And then you may work for a company. A company send people off to get training. They come back and they still don't know what to do. They didn't pay attention when they went to the seminar. And so all of that is designed for us to upgrade our quality of life. But you got to start at some point in upgrading my quality of life. So if I could provide for you an upgrade of your quality of life, would you accept it? And would you accept it immediately? Would you accept God's upgrade? Would you make a decision today? Uh, would you say, I will begin immediately upgrading the quality of life 
that I enjoy. Are you totally satisfied with the direction in which your life is going? If you're not satisfied, if you're not totally satisfied, guess what? You have to make some decisions. If you do not like where the roads you are traveling are taking you, then you've got to make a decision to get on a different road. If you stay on Interstate 85 North, you cannot help but end up in Charlotte every time. So if you don't like going to Charlotte, then you're going to have to get on another road. You can't get on Interstate 85 and go north and then pray that you get to Atlanta. It doesn't work. All right. So how do you feel about trusting God for a total upgrade of your life? See, the challenge is we don't want to trust God. See, that was Adam and Eve's problem. They didn't trust God. God said there's a tree over there. If you eat of that tree, you'll live forever. And guess what? He said, but now if you eat of this tree over here, you're going to die. Right. And guess what they did? Satan came along and said, God didn't tell you the truth. Mm. And guess what? They got us all in trouble. Mm. Every time you have a pain in your body, you ought to remember it's because Adam didn't trust God. You know, some days if I could get my hand on Adam. <laughs> yeah. Listen. Trusting God as the source of directions for our life. It starts with a total surrender to Jesus. A total surrender to Jesus. Well, how do I totally surrender to Jesus? Let's notice a man who totally surrendered to Jesus. This story starts in Acts chapter 10. And we have the verses on a man by the name of Cornelius. I want you to notice something about this man. He was a devout man before God. He was devout, but he was not forgiven of sins. He was not forgiven. Cornelius feared God, but he wasn't saved. He gave alms to the people, but he was not saved. He prayed, but he was not saved. He saw an angel but he was not saved. Look at verse number 2. Now there was a man of Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion, which was called the Italian cohort, a devout man. One who did what? Feared God with all of his household. And not only did he fear God, he had influenced his household. Now watch the text. He gave many alms to the Jewish people. He prayed to God continually. And about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of the God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. Now, you read that, you think, that man's got to be saved. But he's not. Watch the text. Go to chapter 11 and verse number 13. Sometime later, here is Peter's conversation with him. He reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here and he will speak words to you by which you will be saved. You see that? He was not saved because he was devout. He was not saved when he prayed. He was not saved when he saw an angel. He was not saved when he gave alms to the people. He was to be saved after he heard words. Amen. That's a good one. You got to hear the word. That's right. And then you got to obey what that word will say to you. That's right. Now look at that again. He will speak words to you yeah. by which you will be saved, you and your household. Yeah. Now Cornelius could have offered some excuses. He could have offered some excuses toward Peter who was the messenger. He could have said, this is the first time I've ever saw him. I've ever seen him. This is the first time I've ever heard him. And by the way, I've heard that that Peter has a treacherous temper. I heard Peter cut a man's ear off. And I heard he even denied Jesus. He could have offered all of those excuses. But guess what? He would have still been lost. Always remember something. Just because you find a flaw in somebody else's life doesn't straighten out yours. All right? He could have offered some objections toward the message. He could have said, that's the first time I've ever heard a message like that. 
He could have said, my mom and daddy never heard a message like that. And not only did they not hear a message like that, they never did that. But he didn't offer excuses. In spite of all of that, after he heard about Jesus, he became baptized. Amen. He became baptized. Look at verse number 48 of Acts chapter 10. And he ordered them to what? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And they asked him to stay on for a few days. Yes. Now, don't you think about that. Here's a man who is devout. He prays. He gives. He sees an angel. The Lord spoke to him. But guess what? He's still unsaved wow. until he's baptized. Right. You know why? Not that he wasn't a bad man. That's not it. Because God has designed a process by which people are forgiven of sins. Amen. And after a person has heard the gospel, believed it, repented of their sins, confessed Jesus as Lord and Christ, yeah. and is baptized, yeah. that's when God decides to forgive. Amen. Listen, it is God who forgives. That's right. We have to let him decide when he's going to forgive. That's right. You ever decided to someone say, listen, how many of you have grandchildren? Uh, but but you, are, you, you are a grandchild then. If you don't have grandchildren, you, know, you do have a grandparent or you had a grandparent. Imagine your grandparents say, come over to my house, spend the night with you, with me, and I'll give you a down payment for your car. Come over to my house, spend the night with me, I'll give you a down payment on your car. Come over to my house, spend the night with me, I'll give you a down payment for your car. But what happened? You used to go, oh, Grandmama, can you, uh, 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 my brother going to be by the house later today. Can you send the money by him? <laughs> Let grandmother decide the requested criteria for her to give you the down payment. But see, we want to tell God how to save us. We don't get that privilege. And it's so simple. Hear the gut word, believe it, repent, confess. And be baptized, Amen. and he will forgive us of all of our sins. Amen. Now, why did Paul, why did Peter say that? He said that because that's exactly what Jesus taught him. Yeah. In Mark chapter 16, in verse number 16, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, he said, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Where did he put salvation? He placed salvation after baptism. So God's the one who's going to save us. He's going to save us through Jesus. So let him tell us. When we're going to be saved, Amen. let him tell us how to be saved. Amen. And we discover that when we spiritually meditate on the word of the Lord. Amen. I want you to think about seriously where you are. Do you need to do something to upgrade your quality of life? If you have not come to that starting point, if you have not been baptized for the forgiveness of sin. And when one is baptized, they have to be baptized intellectually. You have to be baptized knowingly. You cannot just be baptized and then sometime later discover what God requires because baptism is an intellectual, intelligent response. It is just like getting married. You have to do that intentionally. Right. You have to do that intentionally. You know, nobody gets married and didn't know they were married. So nobody becomes saved and didn't know they were saved because it requires an intelligent, intentional response. Amen. Now, all of us have been to a wedding rehearsal. You know, on a Friday, people go through a wedding rehearsal. Guess what? They are not married on Friday. You know why? Because they didn't intend to. Now, when they came to the rehearsal, they could have said to the preacher, you know what? We don't want to come back out here tomorrow. Let's do that tonight. And guess what? They'd have been married. But see, baptism is only valid if it is intentional. And it cannot be intentional if we have not been taught. So we have to be taught and understand what's the purpose of baptism. It's not just a good something to do. It is the proper thing to do, but only when we understand what it is we're doing. You know, many people have been baptized had no idea what it was all about. That really was not a baptism. It really wasn't. If you find yourself in that category, you need to do something about that. You need to do something about that today. And if you're one that have not been meditating on the word of God, you need to do something about that. Start meditating on the word so God can transform your life and make you into the person that you have never thought you could be. Praise you.